lovely to see you all again. And um, I just wanted to spend some time talking about precision medicine because this is something really close to my heart. And it's something I think we do really very well in the lovely clinic. And it's quite a unique approach to looking at some of the common skin and hair loss problems that we see. I suppose the first thing to say is that what is precision medicine? And really this is a combination of a couple of approaches. First of all, if we have a specific hair problem or a skin problem, the temptation is, as doctors is just to look at that problem itself and try to treat it directly. What we generally do at the Lovely Clinic, and you can see my, my colleague Sarah Tonks there as well, we try to unpack the problem a lot more. So we'll do a range of testing, so that can include blood tests, it can include a urine test, as well as um, DNA testing as well. And that way we're taking a much more inside out approach to your health or your skin problem or your health problem. In addition to that, the other big uh, weapon in our approach is that we use branded pharmaceutical products. We use aesthetic, facial aesthetic treatments. We use um, platelet, uh, sorry, platelet rich plasma treatments as well. And we also use compounded prescription products that are specifically tailor-made to our patients. So a prescription product is generally something that's made by a pharmaceutical company. It's made, it, it's mass produced, and then um, it's easily available for doctors to prescribe. So a compounded medicine is slightly different. It's made specifically for a specific patient. So it's almost like having a dress that's made um, for your figure, your body shape, as opposed to getting a dress that's, that's off the rack. Now there's advantages to both approaches, but when it comes to compounded personalized medications, we've got some really interesting things to consider. If you have brand, branded licensed compounded, uh, branded licensed products, which are easily available and prescribed by our doctor, they tend to be in fixed doses. So for any skin problem or hair problem, that product is in one dose. And this makes less sense if you have someone who's six foot tall compared to someone who's uh, four, four and a half feet tall, because the dose isn't necessarily going to be customized to the patient. So in fact, the doctor has to fit the product, the, fit the patient to the product that they can prescribe. By definition, a mass produced pharmaceutical product is not designed for individuals. And it might contain ingredients that patients are, are sensitive to, they don't tolerate well, or they may even be allergic to it. And usually these products just have one route of administration. So it's often, say, for example, a tablet. And in many people who don't tolerate tablets well, they may not be able to access this medication. The other thing which is really more relevant for things for treatments like acne treatments is that usually there's only one pharmaceutical prescription ingredient included in the branded licensed formula. So even one of the best acne treatments that your doctor can prescribe um, only has two active ingredients. So that's a huge limitation in terms of licensed products. The benefits though and the advantages to these products are that, are that they're usually very easily available, very easy for your doctor to prescribe, and there is a wealth of research and evidence base and studies that have been carried out and usually sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies that, that make them, patent them and market them. The difference with some of the compounded personalized prescription products that we make, um, the, the main difference is that it's customized to the patient. So we can actually fit a product to the patient sitting in front of us. We can drop out ingredients that the patient's reactive to or allergic to. If they can't tolerate it by tablet or they don't tolerate it by a, by a, by a gel that they apply on their skin, we can use it, we can have it formulated into a product that they, um, that they inhale, for example, um, or they might use as a pessary. And that's the real advantage of being able to select how the product is incorporated or administered to the patient. We can also select properties. So for a good example of this is that in menopause, I generally prescribe women progesterone. Now progesterone as a capsule that's branded and easily available from the pharmacy is a very good product. But one of the main symptoms is bad sleep. And this particular capsule that I can prescribe is very rapidly used by the body. So the, the patient will go to sleep quickly 
but they might wake up in the middle of the night because the product has been quickly used up, the progesterone has been quickly used up. So what I can do with a compounded product is have it custom made so that it has a sustained release formula that lasts throughout the night and the patient gets the best rest, the best sleep. So that's another huge important um, dynamics related uh, advantage of these compounded products. Another huge cost effective reason why we use the customized um, prescription products is that they tend to be able to incorporate multiple ingredients. So unlike the branded products, we can have four, five, sometimes six active pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical ingredients in one product. And now this saves the patient money. Um, it's much easier to use. You don't have to use layers of products, for example. And it's much simpler to use. The major disadvantage for me is that these have to be made by pharmacists who have extra qualifications in compounding. There is a real art to compounding. And there's only five reputable uh, compounding pharmacies in the UK at the moment. And prior to the two that I'm using, uh, prior to me finding them, I was using one in Germany, which had its own problems in terms of transport. But the ones that I use now have excellent quality control and they con consistently provide reliable, compounded, personalized prescription products, which I have full confidence in prescribing. So what does this look like? If you come, say for example, you would like to improve your skin quality. You want to make your, your aging skin look better and better and reverse some of the signs of aging. So if you come to a consultation with us, we will offer you different options. And one of those options might be a manufactured licensed product like Obagi Medical. And this is one of the world's best known, one of the most frequently prescribed products um, or medical systems available. It's very, very powerful. And it's very, um, it's, it has an excellent reputation. The, side, the only problem is that it has some significant side effects like peeling, redness, and irritation. In addition, it's very, very expensive. In the UK, the cost of this system is anywhere between 400 to 800 pounds. Um, and it usually needs a prescription as well. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of products. So you have to layer the products one after the other. And a lot of people don't have the time for this. So one of the options I might be able to offer you is um, a, a compounded, personalized product, which has all of the same active ingredients, but perhaps at much lower doses or much lower concentration so that it reduces the side effects of using these ingredients. And also this tends to be a much more cost effective option as well, because you're not relying on so many products in, as, part of the, as part of the treatment. Similarly, if you come to us for a hair loss issue, which we're just about to delve into, um, we might offer you a prescription product like minoxidil, which is Regain, or the finasteride tablet. And these are both very effective treatments, but they have their own drawbacks. So in general, what we tend to do is we will have a product that's custom made for you that includes at least six ingredients to maximize the results and bring about hair regeneration. And I think certainly when it comes to hair loss, um, prescription personalized products, precision products, are probably my most favorite way of treating hair loss. So if we start with hair, um, hair structure is really interesting because it is an appendage of the skin and it contains the same protein that's abundant in the skin. And this protein is called keratin. The hair structure itself is either vellus or terminal. And vellus is that sort of very fine, very soft hair that we see on babies' skin or on their scalp sometimes. And it's almost invisible. And that compares well to that compares to the, the terminal hair, which is the coarse, thick hair that we want on our scalp, on our scalps, that beautiful, rich hair. That's known as terminal hair. And the reason I'm explaining these is because there, there can be a trigger between these, these different forms of the hair. So that trigger might be an excess of androgens or testosterone, or it might be a chemical treatment like chemotherapy used for cancer. And um, what's interesting is that the hair, when it's in the growing phase, it grows by a centimeter every month. So every year on average, the hair is growing about 10 centimeters to 12 centimeters. 
And this is relevant because when we look at the hair growth cycle, we know that the hair is in the growth phase um, for a limited time. Now that time in anagen, it's called, is dependent on you. So everyone is different and you may have a hair growth phase that is only two years. The reason that's interesting is because <clears throat> that limits how long your hair can grow. So if you're a woman who's trying to grow your hair, I don't know, 50 centimeters, if your hair growth phase is only limited to two years, that won't be possible because your hair can only grow to 24 centimeters length. So this is genetically determined. After the growth phase of hair, it it, the growth stops and it goes into a phase known as catagen, which, just, which lasts a few weeks. After that, it goes into telogen, which is the resting phase. And the hair bulb or the hair root starts to move up towards the skin. And then finally, it's shed from the scalp. This is relevant because any intervention that we do, any prescription that we give you or treatment like PRP for hair growth, takes several months to show results because this hair growth cycle is going on in the background. And when we're feeding the scalp with all these prescription agents or treatments, it takes that long for the benefit to, to be seen. So just to say, it's important to continue using the products and be patient so that you know, so, and you wait for the results to actually appear. And then in terms of causes of hair loss, I'm just gonna briefly touch on this because this is relevant to dermatology. There is, um, it's not so common, thankfully, but scarring hair loss is where a skin disease or condition will basically obliterate the hair follicles so that unfortunately the hair can't be regenerated. So this is common in conditions like lichen planus or folliculitis decalvins. And luckily these are not so common, but it's lucky because once you have these conditions and once the scarring has occurred, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse that hair loss with some of our treatments. Luckily, the common causes of hair loss are non-scarring, and they're listed here. So we have hormonal reasons, systemic illness, deficiencies in nutrients such as vitamins, or a low-fat diet or a low-protein diet. Stress is a huge player in hair loss, and stress actually triggers the last two, which are known as telogen effluvium, and alopecia areata. So we're gonna unpack these a little bit more, um, but by far the most common age-related um, cause of hair loss is known as, is basically due to um, an imbalance in hormones. It's also known as androgenetic alopecia, because if you look closely at the, at, the, at the process, it's related to the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which triggers the terminal hair, to become the vellus or the softer type of hair, especially in perimenopause or menopause, when the declining uh, female sex hormones lead to this imbalance between male hormones and the female sex hormones. And this is important as well for you just to know, 5-alpha um, reductase enzyme is the enzyme that actually mediates the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And it's relevant because we're gonna use ingredients that basically block the action of testosterones and 5-alpha and, and reductase as well. Um, and just as a side point, there are, um, oh yeah, the, the forms of hair loss are different from men, men and women. So if you look here in the male pattern hair loss, we have this very typical focal loss of hair at the temples and on the top of the head, on the occiput. And then as time passes, unfortunately, this man's hair, the hair loss becomes more and more confluent. In women, the hair loss starts in the parting and then it continues to thin until there's much more hair loss. And you can see that again here. Um, there are some reports of improvement of a female pattern hair loss with a supplement known as Saw Palmetto, and this is readily available from health food shops. But the evidence base for this isn't great because I, I think that there needs to be more um, research carried out for this because this, the standardization of this, uh, this uh, supplement isn't very good. So uh, in the future, I'm sure we'll see some more research about this particular herbal supplement. Um, and just to say that when our patients come to see us, it's often because they are in hormonal imbalance, they're often in the stage of menopause, and that's often when hair loss really presents. So we generally will do a full hormonal consultation, comprehensive testing, and that way we treat our female patients from the inside out. 
There we are, okay. Um, another cause of hair loss is deficiencies and systemic illnesses. So deficiencies are common. For example, we have um, low iron, selenium, zinc, biotin, and vitamin D. And this is something that can be tested in our clinic or by your doctor. Um, overactive thyroid and underactive thyroid are also very important hormonal causes of hair loss as well. Um, as is a low protein or a low fat diet. And then these can all be tested for at your doctor's office and we offer, offer it as well. Okay, and just to mention skin diseases. So there are certain conditions which are associated with hair loss as well, such as fungal infections and psoriasis. Um, and these are very typical, they have a very typical presentation, so it's very easy to diagnose. The good news is that once these skin conditions are looked after, the hair loss usually reverses and the hair grows back. Um, we mentioned stress before as a major cause of hair loss, and in particular, this specific condition known as telogen effluvium. This is a very diffuse pattern of hair loss where um, the hair will start to thin and there will be loss of hair during washing or brushing. And women will complain to me that it's been going on for months. And very interesting in the story of this is months beforehand, there is often a major trigger, like a, a stress, a trauma, like a car accident or a personal problem. And what this does, it abruptly triggers the growing hairs into the resting phase. And because, I don't know if you remember the growth cycle that we talked about before, but because it takes several weeks to months for that hair to be shed after it goes into the resting phase, it appears that it, it happens many months after that initial trigger. So that's known as telogen effluvium. And the good news about this is that it usually reverses itself very slowly, but it still reverses itself. Um, but we can obviously accelerate the hair regeneration with our active ingredients that bring the hair back into the growing phase. And just to mention alopecia areata, which is a completely different entity, but it's also caused by stress, or it can be caused by stress. And this is often common in children, in, in boys as well. And typically there's some major stressful event like bullying or parents getting divorced or a car accident, but it triggers an autoimmune reaction. So this is where the body's immune system is attacking its hair cells. And usually you get this typical presentation of the hair becoming patchy and you get this patchy or focal hair loss. Um, again, the good news is that this usually reverses it itself um, but we can obviously accelerate the hair regeneration with our hair loss treatments. There are some other severe forms of this um, condition where you've got loss of the hair all over the scalp and sometimes over the body as well. And this is called alopecia universalis and, uni and totalis. Luckily, these are not very common because they're very hard to treat. Traction alopecia is a, is a different entity which is caused by very tight hairstyles or sometimes heavy thick bushy hair which weighs down the um which weighs down the hair and causes this typical pattern of hair loss at the front of the scalp and at the temples so these are the very common causes of hair loss and i think rather than going into the pharmaceuticals and the treatment straight away there are some simple measures that we can try first uh guys whoever's just joined can i ask you just to mute yourself so that we just maintain the audio quality there okay thank you very much and welcome um, <clears throat> so just to mention simplest measures first I think stress is a major player in hair loss so there's countless ways to minimize stress and we can do that through meditation through sport through our you know taking up an artistic hobby and whatever gets your stress under control is a very good management technique for improving hair quality and actually quality of life in general um, and then we can check for any vitamin deficiencies. Um, and also we work with a nutritionist to improve the diet to such a state that we have all of the raw building blocks for healthy hair to be growing. Um, as I said, we, meant we always check hormonal health when we can with a series of blood tests and a urine test as well. And we incorporate thyroid testing in our panel as well. Other sensible things to consider is to avoid using harsh chemicals or perms or these solutions in the hair as well, particularly if you have tight hairstyles which cause that traction alopecia that we mentioned before. 
Finally, then we can devise a treatment plan that can, can contain some very effective active pharmaceuticals and let's unpack them. So we've got first line ingredients and then we've got supportive and they are just that. The first line ingredients have got a wealth of research and evidence to show that they can bring about hair regeneration and then the supportive ingredients also do that but they tend to work synergistically with the first line ingredients to give the best hair regeneration and the best results. So we've got in the first line we've got ingredients like minoxidil, dutasteride and finasteride, um, bioidentical hormones, latanoprost and bimataprost and then we've got various other ingredients um, such as caffeine, ciproterone and tretinoin which help support the action of these first line therapies. So if we talk about minoxidil first this is very well known it's the active ingredient in Regain or Re Re Rogaine as they call it in America um, and this is a very effective treatment which increases the thickness of the hair and the, and the length as well, because it stimulates and prolongs the hair in the growth phase. It also increases the circulation to the scalp and it increases growth factors as well. So that's a very popular treatment. The only, the only uh, I suppose, slight downside of minoxidil is that when you stop using it, unfortunately the, the hair that you've gained or the, or the rewards that you've gained tend to be lost. So that's why in my compounded formulations, I usually combine it with other ingredients to make sure that the result is much longer lasting for my patients. So here we have dutasteride and finasteride, and this, this type of drug is often given as a tablet to men for, for premature hair loss, and it has this effect on the enzyme, which I mentioned before, called 5-alpha reductase. And this prevents testosterone having a negative effect on the, on the scalp. Um, Finasteride was the common one. It was marketed as Propecia. It's still being prescribed. Um, the only slight problem, the only complication with it is that it can cause erectile dysfunction in men, as well as another condition called post finasteride syndrome, which is basically a, a longer lasting form of erectile dysfunction, even when you stop taking the tablet. But I generally prescribe dutasteride now, even when I prescribe it as a tablet, because it only needs to be given twice a week. And it has a better action because it inhibits the two forms of this particular enzyme. So this is basically my favorite tablet to give if I'm going to choose a tablet option for a patient. Um, then we've got latanoprost and bimataprost. And this was quite a, a pleasant coincidental finding. But latanoprost is a, is a licensed treatment for glau glaucoma, gla glaucoma um, or increased intraocular pressure which is basically increased pressure within the eyeball. Um, and the side effect was noticed here that the eyelashes, particularly of people wearing glasses, they noticed that the lashes were becoming too long. And they also developed a bit of a pigmentation along the eye, you know, it looked a little bit like an eyeliner, a natural eyeliner had developed as well. Um, so there is good evidence, there's good research to show that there's a benefit of latanoprost or bimataprost in increasing the hair density on the scalp because it mimics the effects of prostaglandins, which are needed for healthy hair. As well as this, it prolongs the hair in the growth phase. Um, I've mentioned before that um, bioidentical hormones are very helpful in restoring hormonal balance when people are in menopause, andropause, or perimenopause. And sometimes just starting um, hormonal replacement, re uh, replenishment therapy can make the hair and the skin much healthier. And also we can use hormones such as female sex hormones and melatonin in very, very low doses in topical formulas for the hair as well. So estrogen, progesterone, both balance against the effects of testosterone. They convert, they prevent the miniaturization of the um, uh, hair follicles into the soft hair. So they, they reverse that and make the hair thick and visible again. Um, Melatonin is a very important hormone for sleep, but this also stimulates the hair into the growth phase as well. And then finally, we've got spironolactone, which is a drug given um, for lowering, lowering blood pressure, but it also has a very beneficial effect in women who are affected by polycystic ovarian syndrome. This works to prevent the action of dihydrotestosterones in the skin. So this prevents acne, excessive facial and body hair growth and it also stimulates hair growth on the scalp as well. The only 
slight, slight um, the two major side effects of this are that you, you cannot have this in pregnancy because it's harmful to the developing fetus. As well as this, because it can affect kidney function, your doctor needs to take a regular blood test to make sure that your kidney function is, is, being, is safe. Um, but the interesting thing about this particular drug is that we can have this made into a topical formula. Therefore, we don't need to do the routine test, the routine blood test that you need to do if you take a tablet. There are some other ingredients as well. So ciproterone acetate and caffeine both prevent the effect of dihydrotestosterone on the scalp. And caffeine also improves the flow of oxygen and nutrients to the hair follicles. Um, retinoic acid is a derivative of vitamin A, and this is very, it's a very good thing we're going to see later for skin. And although it doesn't improve hair growth in, in itself, because it improves the scalp, the skin of the scalp, it enhances the penetration of all of the other ingredients and it helps to turn, turn over the scalp cells much quicker. So if you come to our clinic, why, why might we choose a precision hair formula? Well, as I said before, it's possible to combine many synergistic ingredients in one or two products. Um, and because of that, we get much better results than giving you a single agent. Um, and also this is much more convenient for patients and it improves compliance because many of these treatments are meant to be used for, as a long-term basis. And if they're simple to use, patients will be happy to use them. Also by using it in topical form, we can avoid the need for blood tests, like I mentioned with spironolactone, and also we can avoid the, the side effects, even, even though they're not very common. So we can avoid the problems, for example, like erectile dysfunction or post finasteride syndrome by using a topical form of finasteride. Okay, so the skin um, is composed of multiple layers. And the outermost layer is the epidermis. And this in itself is composed of five layers. The topmost layer is called the stratum corneum, and then we've got various layers underneath. And this layer is really important. This is our primary defense against the external environment, and it's composed of cells known as keratinocytes, and that's because they contain abundant, pro abundant amounts of protein, which are the same protein that was in hair, and this protein is called keratin. As well as keratinocytes, it contains pigment producing cells known as melanocytes and these give the color and the UV protection to our skin as well. Underneath this layer is the dermis layer and the dermis layer is really important for skin health. It contains cells called fibroblasts and these produce the structural proteins collagen, elastin and something called hyaluronic acid which gives bounce to our skin. This gives the structure or that lovely um, support to our, to our skin. And in babies, children, young adults, the dermis layer is very well defined and it's full of these structural proteins, which is why the skin quality is so good. Um, and in that layer, we have the blood supply, we have nerves, we have those structural proteins, and we have uh, the hair bulb and sebum producing glands as well. Underneath this layer, we have the subcutaneous fat. And even under that layer, we have, um, we have the bone, which is the, the in the face. The facial skeleton gives the final level of support to the face. So we've got our attractive contours, basically depending on this layer of bone. Um, so our cheekbones, our jawline, our nasal bone. So if we look at the aging face, so in terms of skin health, the aging face where there are certain things that we recognize. So these would be lines and wrinkles, gravitational folds, sagging of the skin, particularly jowls, and we get a, de a general deflation and volume loss across the face. In the skin itself, we start to see non-uniform pigmentation. We start to see disorders of pigmentation such as uh, solar lentigos or hyperpigmentation. Um, we can often see open pores, and particularly in, in, in the beginning of aging, the skin can be rougher, and then as aging continues and the person becomes much older, the skin can become very fragile and easily traumatized. So if we look at the cellular level of what's happening in the skin, in the epidermis, we notice that cell turnover slows right down. 
because in youthful skin, the whole layer of the epidermis, that top layer, is regenerated every six weeks. As time passes, as age continues, that cycle slows and slows and dead cells accumulate on the surface, which is, which is why that skin layer becomes rougher in appearance. The cells are not tightly organized and the, the barrier function of the skin is lost as gaps develop between the skin. There is an increase in uh, melanin pigment and therefore you get this appearance of solar lentigos or age spots. And this is also the, the time when we start to see wrinkles as well. In the dermis layer, we get the, ma the majority of age dependent changes. So when we look at that picture of the aging face, a lot of it is to do with the depletion of the dermis layer. And this is because that layer loses about 20 to 80% of its volume as aging progresses. You get a decrease in collagen, elastin, and in that sugar hyaluronic acid. The cells that produce all these proteins become lazy, and also the blood vessels sitting in this layer become fragile and leaky, and you also get a decrease in the sebum producing cells as well. Right underneath the dermis, we get a decrease in volume of the fat layer. We get unhelpful pulling of the muscles in a downward direction. And as you can see very clearly in the, in the facial skeleton, you see a massive bone loss in the facial skeleton as well. And that really uh, results in a loss of our youthful contour. So aging itself, and this, this applies to the full body in general, not just to skin, but aging is intrinsic and extrinsic. So by intrinsic, I mean biological or time related and, and really governed by genes. And that's something we test for as well with our genetic testing. Um, but added to that is extrinsic aging. And this is very important because this is basically lifestyle. So when you look at this schematic here, um, when, you lead, when you lead a healthy life, you can improve your genetic outcomes. Your, ge your genes are not necessarily your destiny. And if you eat well, you, you, you enjoy a healthy lifestyle, exercise, you can generally improve your health even beyond your genetic predetermined code. But the opposite is true as well. So despite having good genes, if you have excessive exposure to the sun or tanning beds, or if you have poor sleep, you drink excess alcohol or, or smoke cigarettes, then obviously you can speed up the aging process in your skin as well. <clears throat> and now if we come on to the most active pharmaceutical ingredients, We've got, again, we've got first line therapies and then very, very good supportive ingredients as well. Um, but the first line ingredients are retinoic acid, L-ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, azelaic acid, estradiol and progesterone. And then we've got the supportive ones, which are hyaluronic acid, which we'll touch on, um, vitamin E, niacinamide and boswellia. And these are generally supportive ingredients, which are antioxidant, and anti-inflammatory. Um, again, we always try to encourage our patients to have a hormonal consultation because skin really can deteriorate after menopause. So when we give a whole body approach to hormonal balance, we see that the skin and of course the hair improves drastically as well. So if we start with retinoic acid, this is a pharmaceutical ingredient I, I usually incorporate into many of the anti-aging creams. Um, and this, because it has a very strong evidence for treating sun damaged or prematurely aged skin, it does this by increasing the thickness of that dermis layer, um, by increasing cellular turnover, collagen, elastin production, and it also reduces the, the depth of wrinkles. It also has an anti-pigmentation effect, so it, it provides a, a youthful glow to the skin and it, cause, and it brings about a unifying skin tone as well. Um, it's also very useful as a anti-acne treatment as well. So it can decongest the pores and leave the skin looking even healthier. L-ascorbic acid is the bioactive form of vitamin C. Now, the reason I'm coming to this is vitamin C is a very important anti-aging skin ingredient. The interesting thing is that it's included in many high street brands and many expensive de department store brands as well. Unfortunately, those brands tend not to use L-ascorbic acid. They tend to use other forms of vitamin C like ascorbate palmitil. 
which is not so stable and it doesn't have the same wonderful effect on the skin. And often these cosmetic companies will produce products that have the minimal level of vitamin C that they can then go on to advertise the product as containing vitamin C, but it's in far too low a concentration to be effective in improving the skin against aging. Um, so that's basically something known as dusting, which is a very common practice from the, cosme uh, from the cosmetic houses, because that way they can, they can advertise as con their products containing very effective ingredients, but they don't need to have great expense in um, their formulations. But L-ascorbic acid, which is the bioactive form of vitamin C, it brightens the skin, it's a vital ingredient for collagen and elastin formation, and it also behaves as a master antioxidant by mopping up the damage done by free radicals. And azelaic acid is a prescription agent which is, which is a real multitasker because this is used against rosacea, um, but it also treats pigmentation, acne, and in the very low dose that we use in our personalized anti-aging uh, face creams, it improves pigmentation, it regulates skin texture, and it also has this wonderful equalizing effect on skin tone. Another, another strategy we use in our anti-aging face creams is we often incorporate low levels of hormones, such as estradiol and progesterone, and a powerhouse treatment, which is called estriol. Now, estradiol, is no, which is estrogen, it improves the elasticity of the skin and increases the levels of the collagen, elastin, and hyaluronic acid. It thickens the dermis and the epidermis, and it reduces the depth of wrinkles, and it also promotes wound healing. As well as this, it reduces the amount of facial hair as well in older women. Um, rec a recent study has shown that estriol, which is another form of estrogen, um, is even more powerful than estradiol. So that's, we often include that as well in our range. Uh, and progesterone also has similar skin building effects. So these lo low doses of, this ho of these hormones we often incorporate in our products. Hyaluronic acid is a supportive ingredient which sits on the external surface of the skin and it hydrates and plumps the epidermis layer by attracting a thousand times its own weight in water. So through this action, it smooths the texture and plumps the skin. It's a very, very popular addition to our face creams. So just before we take a little um, uh, comfort break, um, why might we choose to have a precision anti-aging formula for, for, for skin? Well, similar to the hair products, we can combine multiple ingredients, not just one or two um, ingredients into our formulas, and we can also incorporate several anti-aging hormones into our formulas. And again, this increases the effectiveness of the product, of the treatment, it increases the convenience and the long-term usage and compliance for the patient. These products are often much cheaper than the branded medical skincare subsystems because we can have just one product rather than multiple bottles sitting on your bathroom shelf. Um, also, to prevent complications and side effects like irritation, we can reduce the concentration of these ingredients so they're much more uh, gentle and much kinder to the skin. But for me, probably the most important thing is that we only use active forms of these ingredients at the correct minimal concentrations to bring about a result for our patients. So this is unlike many of the over-the-counter products, which only have a dis dusting of these ingredients, and they often only have unstable or ineffective forms of these ingredients. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. And if you guys want to uh, ask any questions at this stage, you can. Hi, Dr. Kishan. Hello. Hi, uh, it's Anika. I don't know if you remember. I've, I've been to your clinic before. Hello, how are you? I'm good, I'm all right. Um, so basically, my question was regarding telogen effluvium. Um, I think my telogen effluvium was triggered by stopping Dianet, which is um, a birth control pill. Yes. Yeah. And um, I stopped it in November and it is now June and um, my hair fall is extreme and I feel like it's not growing fast enough. So what would you recommend? Well, because of your age, you're quite young. I think what we could do is we could, we could look at a hormonal sort of testing for you, 
but I think um, we could use a topical mixture of um, perhaps some hormones to give some balance back into the scalp because Dianet is a strong um, synthetic estrogen um, and also something to block the effect. Basically, we'll give you something which will work in a similar way to Dianet, but much more naturally, much more, sorry, much more um, effectively and safely right. because it will just be to, on the surface of the skin. Okay, and um, minoxidil would not be an option, right? Because a lot of people have recommended it, mm -hmm. but because there's like an initial shed with minoxidil, I'm just scared to try that because I'm already shedding so much. Sure. Um, the thing is, because sometimes you have to go, yeah, I mean, you're right. Sometimes you have to go through a little bit of shedding for the end result. But mm -hmm. many of my patients have the same concern as you. And actually, we just, we don't put the minoxidil in and we'll rely on other ingredients like dutasteride, like um, latanoprost, which is a really good ingredient because it maintains whatever hair is there in the mm -hmm. growth phase. Okay. Okay. So that's Thank you so much. My Thank pleasure. You. It's been nice to hear from you as well. Um, I've got one question from Dina. So Dina is asking, lots of the new cosmetic products now claim ascorbic, L ascorbic acid. Is this also dusted or is it proper? For skin, should we always trust the more medical pharmaceutical skincare ranges over the cosmetic products? Okay. And hyaluronic acid, is it only for those with problem skin or is it for everyone? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, hyaluronic, let's start with this question about L ascorbic acid. I, I would agree that pharmaceutical ranges or compounded products that I know I've made specifically for you, I know that they've got the correct level of L ascorbic acid. So that can be anywhere between five to 10%. Usually that's the, the happy sweet spot uh, concentration of vitamin C without causing irritation. Any higher than 10 or sometimes 20% people will use can cause irritation in the skin. Um, the, the general over-the-counter department store brands will generally just use a dusting of l ascorbic acid so i think the but they are not required to display the concentration of l ascorbic acid in their product whereas a pharmaceutical range by by law and by regulation has to display the percentage so for that reason i i generally i, I can't really recommend over-the-counter department store products purely because we don't we don't know the the level of uh, l-ascorbic acid in that product whereas with pharmaceutical products we can prescription products we can um great so guys um i've got a little bit more and i appreciate this this is quite a detail heavy and um a heavy topic i'm going to carry on if you guys don't mind because i'm going to talk about acne and hyperpigmentation because these are things which are quite common um, but it's going to be recorded so if this is too long you know I completely understand but I'm going to start again if that if everyone's okay so acne is a, is a condition skin condition we, we seek a lot of in our clinic um, it's a chronic condition which means it lasts for many it can last for many years and it can affect not just teenagers but women in their 30s 40s and 50s it arises from basically the, the base of the hair follicle and the associated sebaceous gland. And it's caused by an accumulation of bacteria and dead immune cells, which congest the hair follicle. Um, acne can cause scarring. It can cause a, lo a loss of confidence, particularly at a, a time of life when people want to be sociable. So acne has quite long lasting and, and can have quite detrimental effects. So, in my opinion, when you, when you have acne, if you have hair loss, if you have any condition like this, I think it's a good idea to try to target the cause of the problem as early as possible. And because prevention is always better than cure, like with any condition, any health problem. Um, acne can be caused by the genetics of any individual, um, uh, a hormonal issue such as polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so an imbalance between testosterone and the female sex hormones. And in women, acne seems to be triggered in many people by dairy. So dairy reactions can bring about acne as well. Um, in the medical community, it's becoming widely accepted that the gut is really the central sort of junction between general body health. And if the gut is in poor health, or if the gut has an imbalance of bacteria, then this can actually lead to acne as well. So that's why I mentioned we, we work with a nutritionist 
who is very experienced in improving the gut function to such a good level that the skin often clears as well. But when we're treating the skin externally for acne, the best treatment is to use different, not, not to rely on one single agent, but to use a combination of different products uh, and different prescription products to get the best results. So, um, and also just to mention, you could see in the previous picture about severe acne. At this stage, you would probably need antibiotics um, by mouth or isotretinoin, which is also called ruracetine. And that should, that's a very, very good option for switching off the acne process. But in general, most people who present to us have mild to moderate acne symptoms or ac acne presentation. And we can prescribe for them either compounded or we can prescribe them pharmaceutical ranges or prescription products to deal with that very, very effectively. Um, many of the branded pharmaceutical ranges like Herbagi is one that is again very popular, one that we prescribe as well. And um, they tend to be very expensive and they require many steps or often too much, too many products um, to be convenient for patients. This one, however, Cleansiderm is very popular and it contains two effective ingredients at optimal um, concentrations and it's very, very effective. It's probably one of our popular uh, skincare ranges, for, especially for acne. Um, so some of the ingredients, some of the active ingredients that I use in my um, bespoke treatments, um, we have tretinoin, or also known as retinoic acid, and that's a very important ingredient for anti-aging. We mentioned this before. We have salicylic acid, benzoyl peroxide, azelaic acid, niacinamide, spironolactone, progesterone, and zinc sulfate. And wherever possible, I try to make uh, personalized treatments, which are topical versions of tablets, because that way we avoid going through the gut, we avoid the problems of uh, in, impacting on the gut bacteria, and also we avoid some of the typical side effects of antibiotics and isotretinoin. Um, as I mentioned, we always try to recommend our patients to meet with our nutritionist so that they get the best overall inside out precision approach. So if we talk about some of the ingredients, tretinoin we've, we've met before, we know that increase, it, it, it increases the rate of cell, cellular turnover, it reduces the appearance of spots and it prevents them coming back. Um, because the, the branded versions or the prescription versions of tretinoin can be quite high, they, can, they are known to cause um, redness, peeling and irritation, which is a really common side effect with prescription brands of tretinoin. So in my compounded version, my personalized formula, um, I tend to do slightly lower doses so that they are tolerated better and my patient will get the same benefits. They just might take slightly longer, but we avoid the side effects of them. And then we have salicylic acid, which is some of you may recognize, it's derived from aspirin. Um, it's an alpha hydroxy acid, which, or beta hydroxy acid, I can't remember now, but it basically it thins the skin very, very gradually and it prevents the accumulation of dead cells and congestion in the comedone. It also behaves as an antibacterial agent and it dries out the skin so it can heal from the acne. We came across azelaic acid before in the anti-aging bit um, and this is very helpful in people who have acne that heals but heals with a pigmented brown spot because azelaic acid regulates um, pigmentation and it prevents this phenomenon of the spot healing with pigmentation. Azelaic acid is, is also antibacterial and it prevents the spots and blackheads from coming back. Um, as I said, in, in slightly more severe acne, um, I use antibiotics such as clindamycin or erythromycin and antibiotics by, by their very nature, they are antibacterial, they fight infection of the skin, and they slow or stop the growth of the bacteria. They also have a very good side effect of reducing swelling and inflammation in the skin. By, not giving, by giving the antibiotic as a topical formula and not as a tablet, it prevents all the good bacteria being cleared out from the gut. So this is a, a very useful reason to use compounded antibiotic prescriptions. Benzoyl peroxide is an interesting uh, agent. It's very, very effective against the bacteria that causes acne. 
Um, so it's effective against this organism called P. acnes. It also slows the production of oil on the skin, so it prevents the, the, the follicles becoming congested, and it prevents the, the spots appearing in the first place. Interestingly, commercial over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide brands use a form of benzoyl peroxide that is far too large. The molecular size is too large to penetrate the base of the acne, and therefore it can't get in. Whereas the benzoyl peroxide that we use and the one that's um, available at Biovagi is small enough to penetrate and clear the acne lesion from within. We also talked about spironolactone before, which is an anti-testosterone drug which acts on the skin and traditionally given as a tablet to combat acne and PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. But I generally will, will put it into a topical an anti-acne formula and therefore we don't need to give blood tests to our patients regularly to, to monitor the effect on the kidney. For acne that's very swollen or very red, progesterone can be a very useful ingredient because it slows the flow of blood to the acne and it reduces inflammation. And then we have zinc sulfate, which is a very useful mineral. It reduces the production of sebum, it combats inflammation, and it also regulates the function of the, of the skin cells and it also limits how quickly the bacteria can grow. So again, we're coming to, to the end, we're coming close to the end now. Um, why would we consider a precision acne treatment formula as opposed to a Baji Cleansiderm or some of the prescription creams available very easily from your doctor's office? Well, quite simply, it's possible to include multiple ingredients in one product. And that's really the game changer for my patients because they don't have to use multiple layers of treatments to get the same result. So this means it's convenient um, for the patient. They can use it for as long as the acne is bothering them or causing them a problem. Um, and also when we use compounded formulas uh, for drugs like spironolactone, we don't need to do regular blood tests. And also we avoid the side effects of taking some of the stronger drugs like antibiotics um, by using it as a topical version. So guys, there's just one more topic left, hyperpigmentation. Um, and this is something that we also see a lot of. Um, and the medical fraternity, that particularly in dermatology, disorders of pigmentation have now been classified as a chronic skin disease. It's now classified as a medical condition because there is a lot of psychological distress associated with it, or there can be. And a recent study has shown that um, if you look at overly pigmented or hyperpigmented skin, it's, it tends to be associated with older age. So if you want your skin to look more youthful, more healthy, um, it can be a good strategy to treat the pigmentation or certainly to prevent the pigmentation. And this is very, very important. All acquired pigmentation disorders are triggered by UV radiation exposure. So you should always wear sun protection factor. I know some of you are in Dubai and in much hotter places. So it's, I'm going to go to my, my best sun protection for you in a moment. So you know which is the best one. Um, pigment is basically, in the skin, it's uh, melanin. And melanin is produced by pigment producing cells known as melanocytes. And they, trans they produce the melanin and they transfer it to the other skin cells in the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, which we looked at before. And the melanin pigment is produced from the protein tyrosine, and this undergoes multiple metabolic reactions before it becomes melanin. And healthy skin has a lovely even distribution of, of melanin throughout the skin cells, and this gives us our characteristic skin color and also gives us protection against UV radiation. Um, when you have an accumulation of a excess melanin, particularly in older age, um, this is referred to as hyperpigmentation. And there are different forms of pigmentation which we're just about to go into. So freckles are really common, particularly in childhood, and they tend to be round, they're, they're, they're harmless pigmented spots, which usually fade of their own accord once the person is, is not exposing themselves to the sun. So usually in the winter, the freckles will fade. Um, it's much more common in redheads and pale skin uh, people. And in these particular people, it's, much, uh, it's an indication that they should be protecting themselves um, from the sun and against skin cancer because um, it's much more common to have um, precancerous lesions in these particular people as well. 
We have age spots that appear usually after the age of 40, although I have one on my hand. Um, and this is caused by excessive cumulative sun exposure. Um, and they look like freckles, which are basically grown together. Sometimes they can be slightly raised um, and they can be treated in some instances with a TCA or trichloroacetic acid peel or a phenol peel. But that's really in, in specialist clinics like ours where we, we undertake that kind of treatment. It's not, it's not a home treatment that you'd want to do. Um, melasma, cloasma, or the pregnancy or pill mask. This is a unique type of pigmentation which forms like a, a pigmentation mask on the face. And you get this, this phenomenon called confetti sparing where you can see islands of unaffected, unpigmented skin sitting in amongst the pigment, pigmented areas. It's not very well understood as a skin condition, but it's thought to be closely linked to hormonal imbalances, particularly an excess of estrogen. So it's more common in women who are pregnant, women who are on the pill, um, and it's also more common in women who easily tan anyway. And something unique to certain ethnic groups, such as Indians, Pakistanis, Middle Eastern or Latin and some other ethnic backgrounds is this hyperpigmentation known as post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And this is a combination of exposure to the sun as well as an inflammatory insult. So this could be something like an, an acne mark, um, a burn or any skin trauma like a scar, for example. Here, the melanocytes are triggered to release their pigment deep into the dermis and this is the opposite direction to normal because normally the melanin pigment is supposed to rise up into the epidermis and to be distributed amongst the other skin cells. So in this situation, you can frequently see a grey blue pigmentation, which can be very stubborn. It can take months to be faded away, if at all. Um, what's unique about this is if, you, if we treat, if we see this or if we see a patient who has acne, we can include anti-inflammatory agents in their topical product to prevent the pigmentation from being uh, left after the spot has healed. So now if we're going to, going to go into prevention or treatment of hyperpigmentation, I can't miss this particular slide because your sun protection is going to be the most effective defense. Um, and this particular range, um, Allumier, is leaps and bounds the best sun protection I've ever come across because it's a physical sunblock, it doesn't interfere with your hormones and it, it's not absorbed into your, into your physiology. So for example, it sits right on the skin surface and it's not interrupting any other physiological processes going on inside your body. And Illumier is one of the sunblocks, that, sunblock ranges that we recommend every day at our clinic. And it protects obviously against aging, external aging of the skin as well, as well as cancer. Um, okay, now once you have pigmentation, what are we going to do about it? And in this picture, you can see a woman who has had a very effective um, uh, treatment for her melasma. And this has been through a range, she has used a range known as uh, ZO which is available throughout the world. And I remember when I worked in Dubai, this was a very popular treatment range over there. Um, some of the active ingredients in that range include hydroquinone and arbutin. Other ingredients that I commonly use for my patients include cystiamine, tranexamic acid, kojic acid, and azelaic acid. Um, hydroquinone is still the gold standard in terms of treating hyperpigmentation, and it slows the rate of melanin production. If you see some doctors who aren't necessarily keeping up to date, um, they may tell you that uh, hydroquinone blocks the enzyme tyrosinase. <clears throat> this is no longer the, the case. This is no longer supported by science. Um, we know that hydroquinone affects the function of the melanocyte or the pigment producing cell in a different way. Um, there is a side effect to hydroquinone when it's been used at much higher uh, concentrations and for more than five months, there is a very rare risk of something called ochronosis occurring. And this is, ironically, a persistent blue-black discoloration. Um, and this is very difficult to treat. So the emphasis here is that when you're, when you're being treated or if you're using hydroquinone as an agent for pigmentation, you should be doing it under the direction of a doctor who can basically time 
the treatment program for you and then switch to a non-hydroquinone uh, treatment once you finish that particular phase. Um, there are safety concerns about this, this uh, agent, hydroquinone, but that's based on some rat studies which are not applicable to humans. And in fact, um, now hydroquinone, partic particularly if it's being prescribed by a doctor for you, um, is a very safe, very effective treatment for pigmentation. And that, again, similarly, the old fashioned thinking is that this other ingredient, which I'm gonna mention, arbutin, because it's not hydroquinone, it can be used when, you're not, when, you, when you can't use hydroquinone. The problem with this thinking is that arbutin actually converts to hydroquinone by the skin bacteria um, and also in the gut <clears throat> once you've applied it. So this is not an option to use as an alternative to hydroquinone. Um, next, we have a very interesting, very exciting ingredient known as cystiamine, and it's marketed under the name Cispera. It's a very novel formula of a forgotten ingredient which was discovered in, discovered in the 1960s. And at that time, it was shown to be the, the best, most effective treatment against pigmentation with similar results to hydroquinone, if not better. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it into a formula that didn't stink of skunk. So it was such an offensive smell that you couldn't, you, that it was not tolerated by patients. So that's why hydroquinone became a very, um, uh, a favorite treatment for, hy for hyperpigmentation. But now they have made cystamine into a uh, cosmetically tolerant, tolerable formula, um, and it's a potent antioxidant and it increases glutathione, which is the body's master antioxidant. And this also interferes with pigment production, and it can be used also with other gentle skin lightening ingredients as part of a non hydroquinone program. So this is a very exciting prescription agent, um, which is very, very popular with my patients at the moment. Um, we've got some other ingredients and then we're nearly finished. Um, kojic acid, this has been shown in studies to be effective, uh, as effective as hydroquinone, particularly at 4% concentration. There's multiple products on Amazon that claim that they contain kojic acid, but in nowhere near the type of concentration that it needs to be effective. And this ingredient does block the tyrosinase enzyme and the production of melanin. It's very effective, but it needs to be in the correct concentration. Um, tranexamic acid is a drug that's traditionally been used to stop excessive bleeding from menstruation or damaged gut lining, or even after surgery. And studies have shown that when this has been taken, even as a tablet um, or as a topical form, it is very, very effective against melasma. Um, there is going to be a licensed product, um, a licensed prescription uh, tablet for tranexamic acid, um, which is to be taken twice a day for 12 weeks to clear pigmentation. And this is probably one of the most effective treatments available, and it will be available very soon. But we already use it in a topical form, which has, been, which has shown excellent results. So this is, I think, the final slide. Um, why would we have a precision hyperpigmentation treatment? So again, when it comes to personalized compounded products, we can combine multiple ingredients um, in one formula, and we can combine it with other ingredients for anti-aging or anti-acne. And this increases the convenience and compliance for our patients. It also reduces the concentration of potentially harmful ingredients, and it minimizes side effects. And again, we only use active forms of ingredients at the correct concentrations, unlike some of the over-the-counter products or Amazon products, which make grand promises, grand claims, but are not effective in treating pigmentation. So, um, thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate that was a, a very long presentation, um, but I hope this is gonna give some knowledge and some empowerment to people, because I think rather than just going to, along to a doctor to see to have a problem taken over. I think it's quite good for people to know what they might be using on their skin or their hair and strategies they can actually have involvement with to get the best results. So I'm gonna just check for questions. So I've got one. Um, is it true that testosterone prevents wrinkles? 
Yes, in men, testosterone does prevent wrinkles. It also prevents wrinkles in women as well. Um, and so when we give testosterone as a topical gel for women, we, don't, we ask them not to apply anywhere near their face because it can, it can promote hair loss and it can promote um, growth of hair on the face. So we generally give testosterone as a gel to be used remotely, either in the vagina or on the groin, sometimes as an injectable. So I'm just gonna unmute you all. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Hi, Dr. Kishan, I've just unmuted myself. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it wasn't long at all, actually. It just flew by. Um, it flew well. um, yeah, um, I, I, I learned a lot. I hope all the other ladies have as well, and I'm sure they have. I actually have two questions. I sent one, but I don't think you got it. Um, it was uh, about hair loss, and I have one about skin. Okay. Your take on compounded treatment addressing hair loss following chemotherapy. Okay. Um, what how long does it take to work i mean i know it's different for each person and depends on the growth cycle as well but on average how long would you say takes well, i've only re if i'm going to be brutally honest i've only had about three patients who've had chemotherapy and then following a chat with their oncologist they've had the permission to use because I, I like to use hormones, especially for female patients. I like to use hormones on their scalp. But that's not something I do unless I've, I've got the go ahead from their oncologist. Yeah. Um, but in the three patients that I have done it for, um, it's been variable. One, one had hair loss, which was pre-existing the chemotherapy. And she also, um, uh, so because she'd been about two years with significant hair loss, and then she had some chemotherapy as well, which compounded the prop, made the problem worse her results were not very effective and they weren't very, they weren't very quick to resolve. But she got a combination treatment with PRP and topical treatment and then she started to get much better regeneration. But the interesting thing is it took months. It took about six months for her to see any benefit. Okay. And would you say the difference is considerable? Uh, had she not had any treatment like, or just waited for the hair to grow by itself? Would you say the results are very different or is that difficult to say? I suppose it, there's no test to find, there's no real way of knowing for sure um, what would, what could have happened if you hadn't done something. Yeah. But I think that the issue is that we know that in the background of whatever chemotherapy has happened, there's the aging process is going on as well. So that effect of dihydrotestosterone on the hair, on the receptors in the scalp is still happening. So I think most of my patients have the opinion that whatever they can do to improve their result, they will do that. Okay. That's the ones who come to see us. Okay. Um, and for that, for the, and then we get very good results with that. Okay. Thank you for that. And then regarding the skin, I'm sure you get a, like a lot of ladies in the like late thirties, early forties. Like for me, for example, I'm 39 now. I don't particularly have any skin problems, like the ones you mentioned, like uh, rosacea, pigmentation. I don't. I'm lucky to not have that, but I do, I am seeing signs like wrinkles and early signs of aging, like a lot of stagging here. When, when someone attends for a consultation and their skin is generally okay, with the exception of a few signs of aging, would you just recommend uh, anti-wrinkle injections fillers, or would you also supplement that with a compounded product or whatever suits them? to improve the treatment results. How would you, would you, would you use a combined approach or how, what would you recommend? If people want the best results, because we specialize in aesthetic treatments as well, injectable aesthetics and PRP, and we also use uh, ultrasound as well, um, as well as uh, radio frequency microneedling. So we've got quite a range of treatments that we can offer and, it, and what generally happens first, to say someone like you comes to clinic, We'll take 3D pictures, we'll take um, some very, very harsh lighting, very intricate pictures of your face and in all, di in all directions and with facial expressions. So we can see the wrinkles at their worst and at their best. And based on that consultation, we, could, we put together a completely tailor-made program for you. And that's why I really wanted to get across to your ladies about precision medicine, because I think this is where the future is going when it comes to particularly general health, uh, and also in terms of like cosmetic skin health and, ha and hair health. 
um, and and for the for our patients who are really interested in preventing uh, skin skin aging, we do DNA testing specifically for genetic problems that might be underlying skin aging as well. And um, so the the short answer to your question is it's completely dependent on the consultation and on the imaging that we take. And if I had someone like you. I'd probably say do everything because you've got beautiful skin and beautiful skin color. I would say, and you look very young and I can't believe you're 39, but I would say do, um, do everything in your power to press pause on the aging process if you want to, if, you know, if that's a concern for you, but I, you don't need anything particularly harsh. I would suggest uh, a Lumiere sunscreen, a sunscreen and some either a compounded product or a few um, single agent products that we could recommend for you. Okay, thank you. Thank My you. Pleasure. So I don't see any other questions here. I think um, thank you so much for having me, uh, and I just hope this gives some information that patients. You know, it's it's very easy to go into a doctor's office and, and be a little bit sort of overwhelmed with all the different things that are available. I just hope this gives people some uh, background, some information, and um, uh, a little bit of ownership to make informed decisions when they when they seek treatments. For, for, hair, for hair loss or for any skin conditions.